no response at all yet. Keep going down. We can we hear can't you. Hear you. <laughs> yeah, we so <laughs> we'll just have to cope with it. Yeah. Maybe Steve can help. Uh, I've never had this problem before. No, but I told you I did the, the YouTube had cut me off. Do you remember? Connect. Carol Steve, Thompson. Yeah. It's gonna be a bit difficult to coordinate, Steve, isn't it? We don't know what to do about it. Mm -hmm. uh, We're not sure. Okay. Same. We'll have to communicate through the email. What this thing? Oh no, that's only to hear, isn't it? But it could You've got your speaker. volume switched down. <laughs> There's no point in saying if you can't hear you, David. I know that I'm going to write it. Is that sound now? Can you Is hear it? me now? Ah, yeah. Where? Can you hear, no, you can you hear anything? Where? Is that? You have the volume switched off. We haven't got the volume. David, she can't hear you. That's the problem. I can hear. Uh, you can. Oh, I could hear, I can hear you sound. now. <laughs> so I'm here then. Try that. Yeah, try that. It's where Matt play, isn't it? Ah, uh, that's plugged in. You yes, won't be able to hear it. Matt, say, can you hear me now? Hello? Can you hear now? Yes, can we can hear you. Hear. Can you hear us? I can hear now. Good. Let's start again while uh, uh, my name's Steve Cushion. I'm doing the technical support, as it were, and uh, the doorkeeper, should there be any trouble, which is, which is, extreme, which is extremely unlikely. Uh, the normal procedure would be, hello? Yeah, the normal procedure would be that uh, uh, David, Greta has got, who, who was to chair it, has got an internet problem. So David Morgan, the secretary of the society, will, uh, uh, will chair. He will then just say a few words of introduction. While the latecomers are still logging in, uh, I shall say a few words about a forthcoming event that's, that the society is organising about the history of socialism in the Caribbean. Uh, for just for a couple of minutes, uh, Francis King will then say uh, a couple of words about why people should join the society. Uh, and then we'll pass over to you for your talk, if that's OK. Uh, and then after that, uh, there'll be time for questions and uh, comments, uh, hopefully questions that are actually pertinent rather than impertinent. But uh, uh, <laughs> and and uh, uh, and then. Uh, after, uh, and and then we'll we'll we'll, we'll call it a day yeah. after that. If is that is that all right with you as a yes, as a, that's fine as a procedure. Good, yeah. thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks, I was, Steve. Uh, I think I'll say, I'll I'll introduce Sheila just before she talks, rather than before people log on, because I think that's a bit pointless for me to do it now. Yeah. Because yeah. it's on, we're not we're not supposed to start till two o'clock, are we? Nice. So uh, I don't know how, how we're going to fill in. Maybe uh, we, we, speak. Well, we can just people can just go and make a cup of tea or something. <laughs> <laughs> I think Sheila, you're going to speak for about forty minutes. Is that yes, right? That's, yes, that's yes, I will. Yes. If you dry that's, up, if, that's if very exhausted. telepathic of you. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't maybe, quite sure. <laughs> maybe you've I, seen our talks before. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, we did toast you. Yes. What, we, we did host you once before, maybe about 30 years ago. I think it was at Mark's house about 30 years ago, I think. <laughs> uh, and I think we met once at Bishopsgate. Did you go to Bishopsgate once yes, or twice? Yes, I have. Yes. Uh, you must have done. Everyone's yes. been there at some stage. Yeah. I think we met there uh, maybe about 20 years ago. So, uh, but uh, yeah, I've got one of your books here. from This is from 1973. I'm not, I don't know why I'm telling you, but if there's that anyone was... logging in. Yeah, uh, that was an early one. That is right. This is where well, you were very productive in 1973. <laughs> yeah. I think you had two book, two or three books out then. Uh, this is actually the edition from 73. I, I must have bought it a bit later because I was only at school then. Uh, <laughs> I was only 11 at the time that was published. Uh, but anyway, it's, I've kept it in good condition. 
<laughs> so unfortunately, I've not read your latest book yet, but I've read the uh, interviews you've done, and I read the review, and I, I read the uh, profile from uh, Verso. That's how I got in touch with you through Verso. How is the book doing? Well, it, it it's I don't, got a lot of publicity. Yes, it, it seems to be selling quite well. Fantastic. I, and Verso, I I didn't know this, but they might buys books from Verso and so my partner and he got it through the email and it's on the t Verso top 10 but I don't quite know what that means. <laughs> what the other nine are. <laughs> and I, well I know what the other but I don't know what that means in terms of sales. Yeah it's not I don't know it's quite uh, rivaling uh, JK Rowling yet just yet. <laughs> <laughs> she gets all the publicity for all the wrong reasons at the moment. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So uh, anyway, this is this, um, the book's about the 1970s, as far as I'm aware. I do remember some uh, some of yeah. that stuff. <laughs> uh, I so, did a, uh, a long, t well, quite a long time ago in two, 2000, a book uh, called Promise of a Dream that came yes. out that was about the 60s. Six, yes, yes, yes. And I, uh, it's taken me a very long time to get around to it's its sequel. So the sequel is the, the 70s and it so you, starts... The next um, one, was, I assume the next one's going to be the 80s, is it? <laughs> well, it is, but then after that, I'm going to stop. <laughs> but I do <laughs> want to, to write about the 80s because I, I worked then, um, I worked at the GLC in the 80s. Ah, yeah, yeah. Did you it's, work with Hilary Wainwright on that? Yes. She was working there, wasn't she? Yeah, <clears throat> John Palmer. There's quite a lot of Mike Cooley and a lot of progressive yes. people were working at that time. Yeah, I think that 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 period's been forgotten now, unfortunately. I know. Um, well, a lot of what was done has been forgotten, and a lot of the uh, the connections that we took for granted have been forgotten too. Yeah, I, mean, I was very disappointed when the mayoralty came back uh, with the, when, you know when Ken was re-elected. That, that all that period seemed to have been largely forgotten yeah. it became very more marketing and PR and uh, you know the kind of modern day slick politics that seems to lack substance and Boris obviously carried on that <laughs> <laughs> when he became mayor and we're still suffering from that now I think unfortunately. So how, I wondered how often you have your meetings uh, we talk, normally have one once a month, maybe sometimes two a month. Uh, used to we used to meet at Mark's house for a long time, then Conway Hall, and uh, but so since the lockdown and you know, since COVID, we've not risked uh, meeting in public uh, for the last two years. Now we've not seen each other. Some some of us might think that's a good thing that we we can switch off rather than when we get bored. Rather, <laughs> you know, especially with our committee meetings. <laughs> But uh, uh, unfortunately, yes, yeah, so, so it's t uh, once or twice a month. So there's at least 12 meetings a year, I think. So sometimes maybe we did like some up to 20. I mean, Steve, Steve will tell us about his uh, series coming up in March shortly. We, hopefully in February, we're going to have Professor Jeff Roberts, who's got a book out about the uh, Soviet, Soviet Union. Uh, he's a specialist in Soviet history. And uh, so, but he's not confirmed the date yet. I don't, I don't know. He knows exactly when his book's due out. So, uh, but that's that's the next one in February, and then in March we got this series on the Caribbean, and uh, we're, we're, the other stuff's not really been firmed up yet. Obviously, the Christmas breaks intervened a little bit. Uh, so yeah, yeah, we've been going. We've been keeping it going. So uh, I think membership's still continuing we've still published we still managed to keep publication going last year uh, this is a, a recent one that's the one i did on the uh, communist party historians group uh that's the only one i could find so i was i was called in at the last moment to share this otherwise i would have had all list all the publications with me but step, this is a copy of the journal which comes out twice a year i think that's that's the latest one on uh, Eleanor March, and uh, so uh, Francis is responsible for that. So we're quite productive, I think, as for a small organisation. I mean, it's, we're, we're the we're the uh, pre uh, 
with the, with the success of them, the old CP History Group, as many many people probably know. And I, I noticed E.P. Thompson in the background there in, on your bookshelves. <laughs> That that photo, I use, I think I used that photo in the book here. It's from a newspaper. That photo. Yes, I think I got it yeah. from a newspaper as well. It's in it's in <laughs> here somewhere. It's a very nice one of him. It, there you go. Yes. He, was a, he looked very he looked very Byronic there. I think because obviously <laughs> he was a he was a romantic. Uh, interested in the romantic movement and he was a poet as well many people mm -hmm. don't uh, remember that he was also quite a uh, you know well good uh, a well-versed poet he published a few volumes of poetry I think I think his last book was a volume of poetry so I know that uh, maybe Steve uh, can come in because it's nearly two o'clock now maybe Steve can come in and do his bit of is Francis here he wants to talk about the membership it's, I think three minutes to two, so we'll start about. Uh, we'll start on two o'clock when I do the formal introduction. How many people are online? I can't. I, we've got thirty people only so far. We did have one eighty registered, which was pretty good going. The last no, that's that's amazing. One eighty. We used to get about fifty. Uh, the last big one we had was John Bellamy Foster. I think we got about two hundred and fifty for that. When he did his uh, uh, introduced his book on ecology, which was uh, you know that was led to quite an exciting discussion. It was very topical just before the COP, well about about a few months before the COP conference. Anyway, Steve, do you want to say say a few words? It's getting up to two o'clock now. No, I've, let's let's just uh, I've just let's just wait. We'll see till uh... we've got thirty people online, so I think it's a bit. We've got no. 37 already. Uh, 30, 36 now. Oh, 39 now. That's I've, good. I've, don't do a countdown. It. <laughs> <laughs> Please. We have... Uh, uh, normally we get about half what the register... I've had quite a few emails from people saying uh, uh, that they now can't make it but would like to watch a recording of Sheila's talk. Will it be okay if we record it, Sheila? Yes, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, on YouTube. Good. Uh, well, no, then I then I put it, I mean, we only, traditionally, we only put up the speaker, uh, not the questions and answers, because that seems fair that you've got a chance to decide what you're going to say beforehand, but yeah. uh, you, we never know what people are going to say and so on. So... Uh, We'll do that, but I've had I've had I've had a good ten emails of people who've now presented their apologies uh, <laughs> to say, but could they catch catch it later? So what what uh, uh, what I tend to do is to uh, put it, uh, I'll trim it down to your talk. I'll put that on the society's website, and then I circulate everybody uh, 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 with the link so that people can watch it again uh, at their leisure. Uh, and so on. And, and also, of course, if there's uh, anyone that uh, anyone here wants to suggest to someone else, I mean, sometimes what happens is someone says, oh, I wish my mate so and so had seen this and they can then enable them to do it. So that that will happen uh, uh, in the middle of next week. OK. And I see Francis is here. Francis is here. Uh, uh, he's, he's transitioned to Sandra for the, for the duration. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm, I'm sharing a computer, and Sandra's computer's in a nice warm room, and mine's in a cold back room, right? So okay. uh, <laughs> it's only fair. So that's. Uh, yeah, I can understand that. I know where your other room is. <laughs> yeah, it's horrible. So, um, yeah. It's both, we're both, we're both here, she's here as well, but we're sitting in the wall. Um, so, David, you, you, you... Yeah, that, well, I'm sharing. I don't know if you want to say something about... I, I mean, it's two o'clock now. I, I offered Steve the right to the floor, but he said he, said he wants to wait till more people appear online, I think. So, no, that, that, that's fine. Let's get started now. I'll, oh, I'll, uh, no, I'll, someone's got, someone's, well, uh, all I'll do then is reiterate here. what you've been I, saying. We've got a lady wanting to ask a question. Um, can, yes, I'll can, let her in. Can everybody hear me? Because yes, I can. Can you hear me? 
Yes. yes. Um, we're not. We're not in the. Well, we're not I could in the hear discussion Steve. Just yet. Uh, yes, yeah, go on. I, go on. Carry exactly. on. Actually, no. Could you hold on? Um, I can hear. I could hear Steve at the beginning, but now suddenly I can barely hear you or Francis. Well, we haven't started yet. No. I, hang on. I think we should, we're talking a technical problem here. When I can see on your screen that you've got a very poor internet connection uh, at the minute. So the problem would appear to be your internet connection. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, and there's nothing I can do about that from this end. You're looking a little bit, perhaps if you turn your, if you turn your video off, uh, that, the sound, yeah. if you turn the video off, that uh, your video off, that saves some bandwidth. That, that's good, yeah, that's good advice. Okay, to... uh, shall I start about talking? Yes, please, 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 please do, Steve. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, just to say that the Socialist History Society uh, is engaged in uh, what to us is quite an exciting uh, experiment from a, a, a sort of online series of events uh, under the uh, title of the History of Socialism in the English Speaking Caribbean. Uh, we put out a call for papers uh, earlier in the year and we got nine uh, respondents uh, from a very wide range, from established historians, uh, 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 post <laughs> postgraduate students, uh, the, uh, 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 someone who runs a women's refuge in Barbados, uh, some uh, the uh, the education officer of the Trinidad uh, oil workers uh, trade union and so on, uh, and uh, it looks like there's going to be nine very interesting papers looking at various aspects of the uh, uh, the history of socialism in the in the English speaking Caribbean. Uh, we're going to uh, we're planning now. This will. This is not set in stone yet because it depends on the availability of the participants. But we're, we're proposing to hold three Wednesday evening meetings in March. Uh, the uh, I think it's the 16th is the first one and then the next uh, the next two. Uh, and the, the format will be that we've asked the participants to provide a full paper of about 7000 words and then uh, 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 that will be available to those who register for the meeting. And uh, then we, we, we'll ask the participants to actually speak to the paper, explain the background, ad adding to it, taking away from it, changing their mind, doing whatever they wish. So that's the format. Uh, it could be quite interesting. We're doing it in conjunction. So it's, it's a joint production, as it were, between the Socialist History Society the Society for Caribbean Studies and the Institute for Commonwealth Studies uh, at Senate House, the University of London. So uh, 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 I'll keep everyone posted through the, uh, uh, the, the MailChimp and we'll look forward to uh, some of you coming and, uh, 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 and participating. Thanks okay. very much. OK, thank, thank you, Steve. That sounds very exciting. Uh, can I pass to Francis now to mention the Social History Society? Then I'll get. Then we'll get onto the talk. I can see now we've got uh, eight hundred, sorry, eighty people uh, signed in. Is that right? Uh, Cox, uh, over to that. It said eight hundred, but uh, anyway, I'm uh, obviously always optimistic. Francis, it's over to you. Yeah, okay, just uh, hi hiding under my pseudonym at the moment. Um, I I just like to draw anyone's attention who's not a member of the society to. The Socialist History Society. Uh, membership in the UK costs £30 a year and for that you get normally two journals uh, and uh, two pamphlets um, as part of your subscription and any other bits and pieces uh, that we publish. Uh, yes, it's, it's easy to remember the uh, where to find us, Socialist History Society, all one word, dot co, dot uk you'll find on there full details of how to join. Anybody who isn't a member, I'd strongly uh, recommend, uh, why not give it a try? Uh, anybody who was a member last year and hasn't yet paid your subs, um, I'm always happy to receive renewals. 
Okay, so for that, thanks, thanks for your attention. I shall hand over back to David. Thanks, Francis. Brief as uh, uh, and to the point. Uh, just mention that also we produce a newsletter. So if anyone's got any information about their own research, please send it to us. You can find all the, our contact details on our website. Right now, we're going to formally start, and I will be, I'm very proud to introduce Professor, I think Professor Sheila Robotham, uh, a socialist feminist historian. I, I, uh, I uh, I want to describe her like that. I think that's uh, not uh, that's uh, that's the best way to describe her. Uh, I think since her uh, career has been spent mostly in research into history, uh, Sheila, you may many people may not know, was one of the founders of the history workshop movement when it was actually a move a grassroots movement of uh, people doing local and socialist uh, and labor research and feminist research was part of became part of that uh, she's also a member uh, elected member of the royal society of Ar a fellow of the royal society of arts so we're very honored by the pre she described uh, so that we're very honoured to, uh, to have her here today. Uh, she'll be talking about her latest book, uh, but she's author of many books. And I want to say she described one of many of her influences have been the Communist Party historians or the socialist historians, including Dorothy and E.P. Thompson. And she described E.P. Thompson as one of when he passed away in 90, 1993. She described him as one of the great thinkers of our time and may I be so modest to say I can say that of Sheila herself because if you look at her bibliography a publishing history it's an amazing body of work I have here one of her first books from 1973 uh, women's consciousness man's world I think it's never been out of print this is the Pelican edition, the original edition for 73, cost 35 pence. I think it's a bit more now, but uh, I think it's still well worth reading. And she was the author of two books in 1973, the other one being Hidden from History, which is a pioneer, pioneering feminist, uh, socialist feminist history of, uh, of women in the uh, radical movement and the women's history within the broader social history. She was also co-author of several books, several landmark books, including Beyond the Fragments, 1979, uh, with uh, uh, Lynn Seagal and Hilary Wainwright. She is also the author of A Century of Women, 1997. I believe the Socialist History Society did host a meeting at Mark's house on about that book in 1997, which should be in our archives somewhere. Uh, I vaguely remembered doing that. And uh, uh, Sheila cites her influences as uh, the, as, uh, the uh, Dorothy and E.P. Thompson. Uh, also, Beryl Smalley, who is a, a medievalist. She was also, medi Beryl Smalley was also a uh, member of the Communist Party History Historians Group. She's not very well known now. I don't think her books are now in print, but she did. A, she looked at the influence of the Bible in the Middle Ages, and it's, it's still quite. That's quite a landmark book, and uh, I, I was quite. I just found that information out uh, because I was uh, jumped. Uh, I came in at the last minute to chair this meeting. I, I was doing a bit of research, and I was very fascinated to find that uh, in, piece of information. Uh, I also found out uh, that. Sheila is featured in the, the film uh, fr from 2020 uh, called Misbehaviour about the 1970 Miss World protests in London. So uh, she's also a, a film, well, a film star on, by second, uh, portrayed in a, a film, uh, not by Keira Knightley, but uh, by another actress. <laughs> Keira Knightley starred in that film. <laughs> But uh, I, I haven't seen it, but I remember it being released. I think it was released during lockdown, so it, it never, no one got to the cinema then. Uh, but uh, that is the starting off point, I suggest, for, for her latest uh, book, which she's, got to, which she's going to talk about uh, now, which is about her work in the 1970s, uh, especially among workers in the 1970s. And I'll say now, I'll, 
I, I won't bore anyone any further. I'll pass over to Sheila. She'll talk for about 40 minutes and then take questions from people. I don't, we don't want questions while she's talking. I, I think she, let her, let her, let, let her do a bit and then, then people can ask their questions if that's if that's all right unless there's something really desperate that people want to ask and Sheila wants to do that but you can make comments in the chat function but anyway I'll, say, I'll, I'll hand over to Sheila now and to, to <laughs> do her talk well, at it's, last at last it's so <laughs> nice to see that you've all come um are you can you it says got it have I got to press? I think we just started the recording for uh, for oh. the YouTube. Yes, I um actually I uh, the, there is a person who appears, and it's sort of vaguely me, but they invent me, so it's quite quite peculiar in the misbehaviour. I I make a speech that they invented that was never done, but they they also <laughs> because they told me that their person responsible for colour said that everybody was wearing dark clothes. So they decided to put me in a rather smart sort of pink suit, which was not the kind <laughs> of clothes that anyone that I knew who was around in um, feminist politics in those early days would ever be wearing. Um, so that was a bit funny. I'm, I honestly don't no, if I'm meant to be called a professor, people call me a professor. I was a professor when I worked at Manchester University, but then I, uh, when I retired, I wasn't. So I don't know whether you just kind of augustly carry on being a professor, whether you've got a job or not. But anyway, um, I um, and I, I, res I left the that um, the fellow as a fellow of the Royal Society because. I didn't live in London, so I couldn't really go to any of their events and I had to pay money each year. And I thought, well, can't really afford it. So I resigned, but that 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 information never kind of gets through. So I just didn't want to have false claims before I start. Um, and I, I'm really pleased that you've been able to come. I, um, I don't know what it's like with you. It's poor pouring with rain here in Bristol and I'm, it's a very dreary day. Um, but I, I've written this book called Daring to Hope, um, which is a cheerful kind of title. And um, I want to um, describe some of the things that are in it and then also talk a bit about some of the um, kind of history that um, we got interested in through the women's movement. A lot of the book is about women's liberation because um, I was involved really from 1969. I um, uh, wrote an article um, which appeared in uh, the left paper called Black Dwarf in, nine, in early 1969. And then from that, I was asked by the May Day Manifesto group that was an attempt to bring the left together to do a pamphlet. And that was how the pamphlet Women's Liberation and um, the New Politics came about. And uh, in uh, Daring to Hope, I've um, quoted the um, feeling that was there in 1979 because there wasn't really a movement, but there was a, an incipient movement. So there was this peculiar sense that something was happening, but we weren't really sure. And we didn't have a clearly worked out sort of idea of what we were about. Um, and I was trying to understand why it was so difficult to express the, the feelings of discomfort and feelings that we didn't really fit. That was very characteristic of the young women like me who'd got to university, we were very much a minority, particularly um, those of us who came from families where nobody had ever gone to university before. Um, communication for people who have no name, who have not been recognised, who have not known themselves is a difficult business. For women, it's especially difficult. 
we've accepted for so long man's image of himself and ourselves and the world as his creation. We find it almost impossible to conceive of a different past or a different future. Borrowed concepts are like passed down clothes. They fit badly and do not give confidence. We lumber awkwardly about in them or scuttle shamefacedly into obscurity, wondering whether we should do our, their, flies up for us, them. And it was that sense of um, bewilderment and um, feeling that there were blanket male dominated culture that had an important influence on us early on. Um, I gleaned insights from Black Power in America and from Franz Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth and also from a lecture that Edward Thompson had given in 1968 to the adult education um, group in Leeds. And it's called Education and Experience. And it's in uh, one of the collections that Dorothy Thompson put together. Uh, in that, he, it, it, I read it over and over again. And I, um, I just find it interesting every time I read it. He, stressed how much can be learned from working class experience, while warning of the danger of simply putting the riposte, as he calls it, of anti-intellectualism against the uh, arrogant upper class of appropriation of culture. Um, it, was, it was very difficult to, to find a language to talk about our discontents, and that was really why the small consciousness raising groups were so important. Um, we got the idea of the consciousness raising groups from the Americans. And if people are interesting, I interested that later I could talk a bit about what people have said were the origins of them. But they they made sense to us because we had all these um, aspects of our lives that were never seen as anything to do with politics. And it was important to try to be able to express them and go over them. It's, it's surprising in some ways that um, more written accounts haven't appeared in about the British Women's Liberation Group because um, I think um, that that would mean that there would be a, a wider context for what I'm talking about. But it, it was a very common feeling um, and it was shared by those of us who were socialists as well as women who were just coming into um, women's liberation groups because they'd heard about them and responded. Uh, the first um, groups that we uh, formed began to think about having uh, a, a conference and originally again we, we hadn't got the idea that we were going to create a movement we thought um, we needed to get together on a larger scale to be able to talk together. Um, and we hadn't any idea of who many, how, how many people would come. And that was really how the Trade Union College um, Ruskin came to host the, women, the first Women's Liberation Conference in, at the end of February in 1970. Um, the, Two students there, Sally Alexander and Ariel Avison, who's um, a great loss. She died in a car accident not long after that conference. She was from Switzerland, and she she was a, she had a great influence on me because she she was very conscious of the significance of a a woman in France called Edith Thomas, who had. Um, written a book about the women of 1848 in France and then she um, had written a book about the women in the commune which was translated as the women in Sendries and Ariel was doing a thesis on the um, a student movement that preceded the French commune so we we shared an interest in um, the history of those um, women and I, that's what I spoke about at the first Women's Liberation Conference, the um, revolutionary um, participation of women in France. Um, a film is, uh, exists of the first 
Women's Liberation Conference. And that really brings this out because there we all are in now. We've got a lot of long scarves and a lot of old fur coats because um, Granny's fur coats have sort of come into fashion. And a few people have got Afghan coats too. Um, and everybody is talking. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, it really gives the excitement. There's not very many visual records of early women's liberation things, so women's place is um, really valuable. And they also filmed the um, it, the first in international Women's Day demonstration of women's liberation the following um, spring. Um, there was uh, that was when. Uh, several thousand women supported by men marched through the sleet and snow through the, the West End singing um, stay young and beautiful if you want to be loved and they also did a great dance that Buzz Goodbody who was in the Communist Party and who worked at the um, for the Royal Shakespeare Company sort of she did the choreography with them so they they did it very well and dancing on a demonstration has a great impact <laughs> on, on passers-by because they all stop and they all smile. Whereas when, when you're sort of just marching along, they're kind of, what's this? Um, it, it was a very visual demonstration. And that, at that time, there were lots of ideas of bringing in all kinds of art and um, creativity into left politics. So... The women's liberation movement continued to do that. Um, the other visual record is the uh, of these very uh, this very early period is the, a lot of photographs that were taken by Sally Fraser, as she was known then. She later became Shandan Fraser, but her photographs are available through the name of Sally Fraser, and they're they're wonderful photographs. I some are in my book, um, including one of the women's liberation uh, contingent on uh, an industrial march against the industrial relations bill in um, the early 70s. It's, uh, um, it's got a lot of people, including Raphael Samuel <laughs> in the shot by chance. Uh, Raphael, um, as many of you I'm sure know, was. Um, really a key figure in creating the history workshop as um, things that uh, co conferences and he worked at Ruskin at that time. So my um, book talks about um, these big events but it also talks about the um, local activity that we were doing and my particular perspective and situation comes from being a socialist feminist in the East London. So that's my particular perspective. And obviously if other people were writing, they probably would have a, a, a different perspective, but there was a, a really socialist feminists were pretty uh, in terms both numerically and in terms of publications and in terms of um, initiating a lot of activity were prominent in women's liberation in the 1970s, certainly until the late 70s. And um, I think that, that uh, the memory of that has disappeared because as it became harder and harder to talk about socialism, um, the memory of what the feminist movement was became divested in many ways of its broader connections, which was came a lot through the socialist movement and through women participating in other um, movements as well. I mean, lots of people were involved in um, movements around peace, um, movements around race, um, specific groups were involved in issues around um, lesbian politics and um, uh, challenging the ways in which both lesbian women and um, homosexual men were, um, cut, you know, categorized as somehow deviant. So there was um, a very strong impulse around both sexual politics, but also connected to um, wider issues about um, immigration and um, 
claimants, for example. So women locally were active in community groups and the kinds of things that people were campaigning for were nurseries, um, refuges for women who'd experienced domestic violence because um, there, there wasn't such, they didn't have such things before. And similarly, rape uh, crisis centers. Um, and there were also women's centers. I, I was involved in one in Essex Road. Um, it was sort of on the edge of Islington heading towards Hackney, which is where I lived. And Essex Road uh, Women's Centre had some very strong links with all the teachers in the local schools. So we used to go around and talk about women's liberation in all the local schools. And we um, also had, there was a group with, on, about women's health and sexuality. Um, there were women connected to the Women's Centre who worked with women in prison because um, Holloway Prison was nearby. And also um, there was groups discussing lesbian and gay sexuality. So there was a really a, a lot of different kinds of activities. Um, I got involved um, with some people in the, I was in a group which was called Arsenal Women's Liberation Group, which sounds incredibly um, ferocious. But actually, it just was called that because Hermione Harris, whose house was where we met, was near Arsenal Tube. So we used to meet at Hermione, so we became Arsenal Women's Liberation Group. And um, I got involved when May Hobbs asked international socialist women to um, give support to um, her campaign to unionise women cleaners. And the International Socialist Women asked me if I would put the message around to people in the workshop. And so people met in my bedroom. That, um, our main meeting places were people's rooms and bedrooms because people didn't really have very many, many rooms. So they, they lived in their bedroom. And um, that May Hobbs came to talk. And that was how a, a group of us got involved with going out to try to get cleaners to join the, tra the Transport and General Workers Union. And then subsequently the Civil Service Union because the Civil Service Union gave more support and um, the support was very important to the cleaners because they were in such a vulnerable position as contract workers. I think a lot of trade unionists thought that was very marginal at the time because they didn't have that many women who, you know, were sort of part-time and um, contract workers. But the, the, there were increasing numbers of women going into the workforce in this period. And so I think that, uh, that there was a tendency to see the, the, the most vulnerable groups as, as pretty marginal. But actually, what is sobering is the ways in which the conditions, the insecure and um, precarious conditions of work became wider and wider. When, I mean, it's in some ways a good thing that you don't, don't actually see the future all the time because it could be pretty depressing. Um, but we did um, try to organize and we did have some gains. The problem was that the, the employers could destroy those by moving the cleaners on. If when they went to a new, sent off to a new building, um, the gains that they'd made then didn't apply. But I'm very pleased to say that there are some young people now who have been organizing with um, contract cleaners and um, have been more strategic in many ways than we were about it. And I think have made um, some headway. But it was different in France because they actually didn't have that um, legal requirement. You could still, um, it still counted when, they, that when people moved from one building to another. Um, we were um, trying to not only um, meet needs, but we did want to create 
alternatives which would carry some kind of alternative values. And um, the nurseries that were set up, community nurseries, were really important in this. Quite quickly, there, um, there were links that were formed between the community nurseries and the general state nurseries where the workers were also unionizing. So there was a, a locally in many places, there could be a combination of unionized um, nursery workers and also people campaigning and being involved in the, in the community um, you, nurseries that had often started as a squat, but carried alternative values. I must say that the alternative values on the children's food were pretty hilarious at my, my son's nursery. They, <laughs> there would be one kind of cook who would say, children like um, hamburgers, so I'm going to cook hamburgers for children. And other people would say, no, no, children should be eating yogurt and cucumber and all these things. And I can remember a ferocious argument in the community nursery management. Well, it was the you know voluntary group, the management. We went over the question of the food that the children should eat. That was in the uh, late seventies. <laughs> the so it wasn't always kind of easy to create the alternative because people had different visions. Of, of how you should be prefiguring. Um, I became interested in thinking about um, whether there'd been people like us in the past. And the, again, the kind of history that was available was not really, um, there wasn't very much about people who were socialists and feminists. So I, I started to research um, into um, the, the obvious places to look like. I, I went to Amsterdam and read the papers of Sylvia Pankhurst. And I realized that the image of the suffrage movement as being you know, very upper class was not really right because there were all these examples of um, working class women involved in suffrage. And I was teaching in a WA class in Stanmore in North London in the mid 70s when um, a, um, my class secretary said to me that uh, there was a former suffragette um, who'd been a socialist for the First World War who lived locally. And um, Florence Exton Han. Her husband was Maurice Han, who'd been a trade unionist in the Shop Workers Union, been an official. Um, he was in his 90s, and uh, Florence was in her 80s when I went to see them. Um, and when I met Florence, I remember sitting opposite her in their suburban house in Stanmore. And there she was, she was 82, and she had white hair that was swept up. All on her very blue eyes. Um, she'd heard tales of Americans burning bras, and her first remark on women's liberation was, of course, you don't believe in trade unions like we did. And we stared at each other in mutual incomprehension. Um, I had the idea of suffrage as being you know, mainly middle class, upper middle class women who weren't very interested in unions. And my, and she saw us as burning our bras all the time. My uh, understanding of women's liberation from Florence was really different. She came from a working class socialist family in uh, Southampton. And uh, her mother was, they were parents were in the Social Democratic Federation. And her mother was an advanced woman who cycled in bloomers, um, but they always took a skirt when they went bicycling, she said, to cover up when they reached town because it was so shocking to see women in bloomers. She was a trade unionist.
pet from a young age. Then as the um, suffrage movement died down as the First World War, um, she and Morris um, kept, were part of the No Conscription Fellowship. And they were organisers for the South East opposed to the war. And um, after the war, they put all the names of the South East No Conscription Fellowship into a biscuit tin in there and buried it in the... Um, they, well, they buried the biscuit tin in the garden. They dug it up in... 1999 to be raided then by the police who Florence said were looking for subversives. So uh, my account of her life appeared in Red Rag. I uh, was um, to go and visit Maurice Han afterwards. I kept in touch with him, but um, Florence died. Um, and he always liked to, although he had moved to the right, he liked to have. Uh, debates about things like workers' control and things like that. Um, he gave me permission to write about Florence while admonishing me, do not link her too closely with women's lib. Unbeknown to Morris, when I met Florence, she'd whispered that he was a terrible male chauvinist and later warned me that her husband was not interested in any women's movements. Still, I was grateful to Morris, for he passed on, oh Lord, these things keep coming off. Um, he passed on several of Florence's books, including one about an early 20th century campaign for housing homeless women. And I'd never known um, about that campaign. And I gave the, the book to the Working Class Movement Library in Salford. Um, the, so Florence gave me a different perspective on the suffrage movement and that kind of contact was really important. Another very different um, going back in time contact was with Dora Russell, who um, I'm sure you've heard of. I corresponded with her at first and I think she was a bit wary. And then um, we met in London and when she came to see her son, I, um, was very interested to hear about the um, work, the, the workers' birth control group that Dora had been involved in. And she made me realize that there was a much wider movement for sexual reform linked to um, the left than I'd understood. I um, went uh, to visit her with Paul Atkinson in 19. Um, 74, and um, she was extremely uh, uh, frank. I, I, I remember being once in a, um, in a in a in a kind of coffee shop at uh, London School of Economics with her, and she had a real sort of foghorn voice, which I think she probably developed through arguing with people in the past, and she said. Um, the trouble with men is they just don't understand women's orgasms, at which point the whole place just completely stopped and froze and gazed at us in complete sort of bewilderment and horror. <clears throat> and I was, I was rather embarrassed, but Dora didn't bat an eyelid. Um, she was uh, completely without embarrassment. She, it was exciting for me to find that she'd actually met two women who I was extremely interested in. Um, Alexandra Kolintai, who was uh, in, involved with the Bolsheviks in the Soviet Union in the early days, and Stella uh, Brown, who was an iconoclastic Canadian woman who um, argued for abortion um, rights for women. In, in a very early time when, you know, women were still struggling to get basic contraception advice. So I found there was a kind of connection between these um, people who were interested in radical ideas and also in, in um, sexual politics. And it was through these connections that I um, also got involved in 
eventually writing a biography much later about uh, Edward Carpenter, who was also um, talking about, um, in, in a period when it was really illegal to do that, talking about um, gay men. So quite a, a few of these early um, origins of interest in women's history, which people like me and Sally Alexander, who I mentioned as one of the people who were studying at Ruskin and uh, organized the first conference, and Anna Davin, who um, wrote about women's history in the early days. Uh, I think both Sally life in the everyday life of uh, working class women. Um, but I, I was always interested in movements and in why um, movements start at a particular time and what kind of people had networks and links. And I think that was um, a difference really in, in interest that I had from um, the, the kind of work that became important for women's history. It uh, eventually um, took me off in much later time in the 2000s to writing about Edward Carpenter, as I said, but also I wrote a book about the, the people who were in a local, the local group in Bristol who were involved in the socialist movement and in um, were advanced women who um, admired Carpenter and I did that in a book called Rebel Crossings. But the, the, funny, the funny thing is that the books that took years and years and years of life were, didn't really have um, as much popularity as the books that I did much uh, more quickly, um, which were in the very early days, um, which were part of uh, my early excitement and interest in women's history. I um, want to read you um, a poem about um, a man called Harry McShane that some of you may know. He, I'm going to end with two, with two poems. He, Harry McShane spoke at the History Workshop Conference in 1976 that was on the theme of workers' education. And um, he was 85. Uh, when he spoke and could remember the, the revolutionary left days in Glasgow in the early 20th century. I, I, I knew a bit about uh, Glasgow's socialist past from a woman called Annie Davison, who Jean McCrindle and I interviewed. But um, I, um, she was, you know, she talked about the Independent Labour Party and the socialist and anarchist Sunday schools, I didn't even know there were anarchist Sunday schools before she mentioned it. Workers, Esperanto, and the clarion players. But Harry McShane communicated uh, another Glaswegian left with this profound sense of import. And I've put the poem in the book. An old man speaks with precision of a lost revolutionary tradition. He tells of John McLean weaning Marxism out of the pain of 1914. Unfamiliar with a microphone, accustomed to speaking with his own voice, honoured to be asked to talk again, conscious of the responsibility of proletarian education. He studies his notes, a weariness in his shoulders passes as he takes his bearings. Standing, he draws strength from comrades long ago and the young who surround him now, remembering so many meetings and John McLean speaking, 60 years or so passing in between. He is still learning, assessing consequences, analyzing fragmentation, still considering the odds for and against working class emancipation. He loves Marxism and nods to an earlier tradition of Scottish hair splitting disputation 
remembering so many meetings and John McLean speaking, 60 years passing in between. He knows we need more than economic argumentation, more than political education, more than the state and revolution. Communism, he says, is only the beginning. He's pushing possibilities, bringing reality to bear on longing, bearing an earthly basis for the dream, holding the dialectic respectfully in two hands, remembering so many meetings and John McLean speaking, 60 years passing in between, an old communist conceives an embryo of longing. And those were the days when being 85 seemed very old to me, but it doesn't now. <laughs> And this uh, finally is one that I wrote about history in the early 70s, as I was beginning to research a bit more deeply and began to realize that um, it's um, always more complicated than you think when you actually get down to researching stuff. I cannot quite get hold of history. I take it around with me. Um, bags and parcels, I never quite explore. One day I'll go right through. One day I'll really know exactly what I lug about. But somehow I never find the time to settle down and search. I often want to fling the lot out into time, jump on a moving bus and steam into the future, driving a red double decker. Instead, I stand sniffing the dust, my parcels wrapped around me, bolstering the night. And now I must say, I kind of time. think, ah, time is passing and I have an awful lot of books and the decision about which to get rid of is terrible. Oh, and that's uh, terrible. I don't know what to do about that. that thanks, Sheila. I think, <laughs> you, I think you've drawn to a close, uh, conclusion there. Uh, what, what an excellent! Oh, going. It seems to be going on and off. I, can you hear me? It's okay. I, I can now. Yes. Yes. My link. My link seems to be cutting out. Unfortunately, I don't know if I. I, I might have not. Might not have paid this month's bill. <laughs> I'm joking, but it's getting a bit. So I'm, let's. Uh, I've, I was saying there's quite a few questions in the. There's quite a few questions in the chat. So I'll hand over to. I've got a list here. Steve, you're not first. Uh, uh, Ta Tara, if you're still there. <coughs> I've Hi. got Tara, Keith, Sarah, and Steve. Tara, are you Tara? Hi, yeah, I'm here. Yeah, go thank on, you very the, much, David. The yeah, floor is thank, yours. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila, for really... Um, I've got your book here, actually, there. And um, I'm just starting, so I, I haven't read it yet. But thank you for all your contributions over the years and, and today. It's really exciting to hear you. I, I, I Forgive me, but I want to ask you just a very broad question. So... And in, an impression rather than detail, but where do you think we are as black and white women in terms of equality and liberation in 2022? I, I just just want a general impression of where we think we've got to. I, th I think that probably there are more people who are aware now of what those problems are. I'm thinking particularly of black women. Um, and well, white white women too. That people, there's more general awareness that there are things that are wrong. But the problem is that so many things that have happened in between have taken away a lot of the things that were very important for people's survival. Because I mean, there was it was things were not great in the 1970s, but you could. <laughs> You know, just basic things like the need to get to a doctor or the um, the availability of some kind of welfare support from the state, from the local state. It that was 
possible. Whereas now all those things have just, I think, got harder and harder. So although there's more talk and awareness about things, and a few women have got into positions that um, are much more visible and better, um, the circumstances, I think, for poorer women and for working class women have got harder. Mm. I don't know what other people think. Thanks. I've got eight people in the chat who wanted to ask questions. Shall, shall we move on, Tara? Is that all right? Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. Yeah, it's a very broad. I mean, point. unless you've got an urgent follow up. I'll move no, on. No, 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 I'll leave. I'll, I'll, that's fine. Thank you. I, well, uh, perhaps I should say that oh, the, in the there weren't the, there were two black women who went to the first women's liberation conference. Only two out of what 400, 500 white women, um, and the ways in, in which women of um, Caribbean descent or uh, African and South Asian descent tended to often get involved in the women's movement was often through community politics, not through joining, you know, going to consciousness raising groups and going to socialist feminist conferences, which were mainly white, but they, 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 they were by the late seventies, some groups that had been more influenced by separatist politics because of the black power, you know, the influence of black power were the women were beginning to um, form, they form groups and they also have a, an organization which had, I think about 300 women came to, the, to their conference in the late seventies. Uh, but there, was, there were less women who were mobilized, but that changes, I think in the eighties that although the white women's liberation movement is disintegrating, um, there are more women from um, black and Asian origin who were getting involved in ideas. Yeah, like yeah, certainly, certainly, emancipation. Yeah, Thanks. certainly people I knew and I was very involved in the late seventies and eighties onwards. And, uh, but, but I wouldn't say it was through, yeah, I suppose the anti-racism movement and the women's movement some of us were able to fertilize the two together, but we were always, well, I was always in the minority and I, I still <laughs> am often. So, uh, you know, I, for me, some things just haven't changed that much. And in other ways, they've changed quite tremendously. So, yeah, it's, it's a very broad impression at the moment, but um, I, I'm sure we could debate it for, <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> Thank you anyway. Thank you. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Uh, Keith, you've got a question. Are you there? Still there? Yeah, I am. Uh, hopefully I'll be oh, right. yours, that. Keith. Thanks, uh, David. Uh, I've read the book, uh, Sheila. It's a fascinating memoir, um, perhaps particularly for somebody like myself who was active uh, on the left in North East London in the 1970s. And in fact, still is. Uh, although the knees aren't quite so good as they were in the 1970s. Um, <laughs> and there's the kind of fascinating vignettes about you know meeting somebody on the 38 bus which of course still trundles into central Hackney or chatting with somebody <laughs> in St John's churchyard. It's my favourite bus, familiar. I love the 38 yeah, bus when it's had conductors. Uh, no, not anymore but uh, it's a new, no, no. it runs about every three minutes so you can't miss it. <laughs> but um, the, the thing that strikes me talking obviously to younger generations of the left in North East London and there are you know several now um, is that they don't know much, if anything, about the history of, that, of, that, of the 70s. Um, many of the struggles that go on now are obviously some battles won, some lost, but, but not everything is the same by any means. Obviously, some, some stuff has made progress, some has gone back, as you said. Uh, but they don't know about what happened then. They don't know uh, the, the battles that went on. They don't know, you know what lessons might have been learned. Obviously, the book is a, is a contribution uh, hopefully to that, but you know, get getting them to even mentioning the idea that you might like to read this book about the 1970s. They, oh, you're not again. <laughs> um, and I think there is a task there for uh, you know socialist and feminist historians to try and think, as you said, about looking back to see in the in the 70s whether there have been people uh, you know in the past to try and get that sense across that 
you know, some of this stuff has, has people have done done work around this before, and there are things that can can be learned. Um, but you know, it, it is it's just understandably because you know the battle is for the moment. People are not necessarily um, as interested as one might like in the history, and for you know socialist historians, that's uh, <laughs> frustrating. Thanks. Do you, do you want to uh, comment well, on that, Sheila? I have, I have come across um, some young women who are researching um, women, women's liberation. Um, and um, I, I don't know about the socialist movement, but they, they um, I mean, one of them actually did a review in, in Tribune of my book. And uh, it's it's really great to to be in contact with them because because I'm you know haven't been teaching for a long time I I have contact with uh, my my grandson who's seven and my son who's in his forties but I lack people in their twenties so it's very nice to have contact with people in their twenties. Mm. Great. Uh, can I, is Sarah but still, I agree, oh, we just do need him. more accounts, we do need more stuff, um, and um, hopefully people would find it interesting. Right. Can, can I pass, press on, or do you want, do you want, to, do you want to follow yeah. up? Oh, Keith's got Keith in the mood. I've got Sarah wanting to ask a question, is she still there? Hello. Hello. Sheila, Hello. thank you so much. That's fascinating. And I, I felt a bit sad when you mentioned Essex Road because I lived up there uh, in the 70s and I was so lonely. <laughs> I wish I'd known your group. Um, <laughs> I did a presentation to the Faisal Mosque, um, which is near me in Southfields, the Ahmadian community. They asked me to talk about feminism in the 70s. Don't know why. Um, but... Um, as I, started thinking, as I started thinking about it, um, I realised everything was so tentative. So it's lovely hearing you talk about that, you know, how tentative everything was. Um, but when you were talking about the community nurseries and, and, and the debates you were having about yogurts and burgers, um, it made me think, surely most fledging groups are like that as people try to identify their shared values and how they're going to be prioritised. Um, and it made me think about citizens' assemblies. And I went to some lecture, somebody was talking about um, how the aim is not consensus in a citizens' assembly, which surprised me, but the, the aim is for empathy and understanding. And I just wondered if you had a perspective now, looking back, different perspective or some perspective to sum up how you think about those fledgling meetings and those debates. And I mean, I, I know from my experience how difficult it is to sit there and, and feel frustrated because other people seem to be going off at tangents. <laughs> um, but did, did you want to comment on um, on anything about what I've said about how fledgling groups try to uh, identify their shared values? <laughs> I, well, after that meeting, I remember one of the nursery workers was very kind of stoical and cynical. She said, the children always leave whatever, whether it's yogurt or whether it, they always leave part of the food so really the children didn't really bother <laughs> which kind of food they got they they ate some and left a lot um, but I, I I did go to meetings in the 80s because the GLC tried to have mm. these kind of popular assemblies and there were recognizable conflicts because the 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 we lot from the GLC wanted to have um, things like you know better housing locally and things like that and I remember a group of women angrily demanding that there should be more office blocks so that there would be more office work because they did office work and and this was you know having more office skyscrapers in Hackney mm. was not really <laughs> what, what we were thinking of so it was like that but we did what we did find was that it was no good if we got some idea of what would be a good project and then tried to plonk it on people mm. it mm. never worked so it had to be something that came out of mm. what people wanted 
and then by working with people, which Hilary Wainwright did in East London and Docklands, it was possible to, to, to raise some mm. other issues, um, you know, <clears throat> that could be, could be put to, as mm. things that people might think of. But not, it was no good if it was just coming from the centre. Yes. It just didn't work. Yes. So very, I think that the, that participation has to be... We keep losing you, Sheila. Process. We keep losing oh. the odd word. Yes. Yes. Yeah, there's an internet connection problem here. Uh, pr 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 show I don't show. know whether my earphones, uh, whether the mic... I think it's the connection. Is, right? Oh, it's a bit late now. You've been on. Now. Oh, it's been it's been okay. It's been okay till now. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, I think it's the connection, not the not the earphones. Can I move on because I've got I've got about five more people to ask. Um, can I just add? Oh, I, so, yeah, sorry, go on, go on. Quickly, so that makes sense then from what you're saying about aiming for understanding and empathy. That because while you're doing that, then shared shared ideas or sh an idea of a shared project which would contain those shared values might emerge i think i think that's i think that's probably a, a common experience that a lot of people have had in yeah. doing work what's happening now thank Gone. you <laughs> uh, Gone. thank you thank you sarah Bye. happy new year uh, yeah. <laughs> steve steve can you uh, ask your question if you're still there hello uh, yes uh, i uh, it's interesting you mentioned the number 38 bus sure. because I I used to drive the number 38 when I were in, in the late 70s when I worked at uh, Leighton Bus Garage. And uh, I remember at, at that time there was a strike at, a, at the Trico factory. Yes. I can't even remember what they what made, the but, but, but we had... Uh, 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 we had a uh, a collection. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, we had a collection on a Friday in, in in the union room, like we like we always did when there was a strike. And I was sent to take it over because I had a motorbike, uh, and uh, it was interesting. When I got there, I I was given uh, this badge that I've still got, uh, uh, a, a woman's right to work. And but uh, uh, I was given a long uh, a long talk about the importance of the Working Women's Charter. Uh, and I was sent back to the bus garage to <laughs> to move that the that the TNG branch in the bus garage supported the Working Women's Charter. Uh, so, uh, uh, I mean, resolutionary socialism. We passed it. We sent it off to the Trades Council. And that was kind of that. But uh, I wonder uh, if you'd like to say something about the importance of the Working Women's Charter. Yes, it came. The kind of movement around it. Thank you. It it, it arose in the in the mid seventies, and it came uh, from an initiative in the um, from that was women who were uh, linked in with the trades councils, and um, they were able to put a whole lot of um, issues and demands, which I think subsequently did get through into unions through local branches again, with women um, raising those, which then became quite significant in the, in the 1980s, because women in the trade unions were taking those issues up. And thanks. Uh, I've got Muriel now. Uh, you, you put a question in the chat, Muriel. Do you want to, do you want to show yourself and ask it formally? If you're still here. Yes, I am still there. It's getting a bit noisy. Okay. That's not working very good, is it? Has that gone off? Who's who's online? Can can Sheila? Can you still hear me, Sheila? I think that was feedback. You've got some other a device open. Yeah, well, you have, so. <laughs> no, I'm shutting up. I, I know that that was helpful, but I think I don't know. If Muriel's uh, can, can ask the question, or maybe I'll read it out. 
I hope you can hear me now. Yeah, I can hear it. Can everyone else shut off, please? I think it's the noises in the cafe, I bet. Yeah, that's probably what it is. So if it's better, you can ask me a question and I can try it. I think that's a bit difficult, uh, Muriel. It seems it sounds it sounds like there's someone else speaking in the background. I don't think we can take. I think it's going to be difficult to take that. I I can read it out. Can 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 uh, Sheila hear me? It's gone now. I mean, everyone everything seems to be gone now. I don't know if uh, Sheila's still there. I could hear you all right, David. <laughs> yes, yes, I know, but unfortunately, I think Sheila's not still not not with us now. I'm I think. back. I'm oh, here. there you are. There <laughs> you are. I think we had a problem with Muriel's connection. Uh, she's asked me to read out the question on her behalf. Let me find it because it's quite a lot in the. Uh, in, I've got it. <laughs> Uh, it relates to the contribution during the Women's Liberation Conference of 1970. How did you and other socialist feminists of the second wave, and I don't think you would have called yourself a second wave, would you? I mean, uh, I think that came a bit later. During, well, people described it such a bit later. This, anyway, I'm reading the question. During your efforts draw back on the socialist feminist tradition of the communards. I think you did mention the communards. Do you believe you related more to the communard sentiments of socialist feminism rather than Marxist sentiments? I, I, I mean, I think that's a polarity, personally. But anyway, I, I don't want to intervene. Sarah, uh, Sheila, do you want to comment on that? Can I, can I just say something here? Can I, before the, I, can, I, can I just say, I, it is really, I think it is, because I'm a historian, I think it is really important to be absolutely not imposing things from the present back into an, yeah. a sort of vague past, because we didn't call ourselves socialist feminists initially. We thought we were part of women's liberation, and that term came from the fact that there had been a lot of movements um, you know, against colonialism um, for liberation. So we saw ourselves as um, women's liberation as this general term. And at the same time, many of the ones who initiated it happened to have also been socialists. Um, and the, 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 the ways in which, um, you know, people were talking at the women's liberation conference was partly reflecting that. So Audrey Wise spoke, for example, who was a trade unionist who played a really important link and later was a Labour Party um, MP. She was able to bridge between the unions and the uh, women's liberation. She, um, and she spoke about um, really why talking simply about e equality wasn't enough. She, she always stressed that because um, she supported equal rights, but at the same time she was saying, it's no good just saying rights within society as it is at present. So there was always a, 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 a questioning of society as it was, of capitalism as it was, but um, it, we, we just didn't say we were socialist feminists until, uh, I mean, it's quite interesting when it, when it sort of begins to emerge, it's really about 73 that we're beginning to call ourselves socialist feminists. Though I, I discovered that people like Dora Russell in the 1920s, unbeknown to us, had called themselves socialist feminists. So there was a history. Um, and um, I spoke about women in the commune because I was amazed when I started to read the journals of 1848 women and also the kinds of things that women who participated in um, the upsurge of the commune were saying was that many of the ill-defined things that we were talking about, about power relations between men and women within the left were actually being talked about 
in that uh, that earlier time in the even you know in the in the the magazines that women produced Revolution France, they, they were talking personally um, and they felt, which was just not the kind of thing that people did in um, when I, I used to be in the Labour Party Young Socialist for ages in the 60s and nobody ever talked about their personal feelings about anything in our meetings. It was completely taboo. Um, everyone talked about those things in the pub afterwards, but it was never seen as anything to do with politics. But in, in the past, it had been more. And so that was really interesting to me. But um, so, I mean, it's, it may sound like nitpicking, but I, I, I do think it's important to kind of to, to, sh to show how the terms meant different, different things. And sometimes we didn't have those terms. Uh, we certainly didn't have the term of being a socialist feminist in um, 1970. Uh, thank, thank Sheila. I don't know if Muriel wants to say anything, but it was, was, was difficult. Your connection was difficult before. If you, if I disappeared. Want... Oh, you disappeared. I think Muriel yeah. had a trouble with the connection as well. I mean, she's still there. Do you want to, do you want to uh, respond, Muriel, or not? Well, I want to try, but I'm at the university cafe, so it's very loud. It's oh, you're, you're, in, you're, in, you're in some kind of uh, uni, university, are you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to put my noise to the microphone. So not the beginning at all. Thank you very much for the verification. Thank, thank you anyway. Thank you. Uh, can I move on to it? Is Ella? Ella wants to ask a question. Uh, is that right? If you if you're there, Ella, unmute yourself and ask your question. No, no, just to wash my hands and I have a cup of tea. I thought. Yeah, I'll make a cup of tea. There you go, Ella. You unmute yourself and ask your question. Hello, happy new year. The the what situation? Sorry. Someone's unmuted himself and has not been called. I asked Ella to ask the question, her question. No? Oh. Right, I can't, I can't see you coming in. Uh, I can bring. I can come back to you, Ella, if you unmute yourself, but uh, I'll mute Maisel. Do you want to ask a question? Yes, you, Maisel. Yes, there you are, Maisel. Okay. Uh, Ella couldn't unmute. Uh, yeah, well, in fact, I'd, I'd really echo the point that Ella, Ella is making. Um, well, what point, tell, tell everyone what point she was making. <laughs> right, that the elephant <laughs> in the room is the fact that we can't get women's liberation without um, ending the system of capitalism and replacing it with um, working class power, socialism. And I don't mean socialism or other, other Labour Party. And in terms of talking about books, there is a book, this one I'm holding, Marxism and the Emancipation of Women. Of that was, it, this is a compilation of essays written by members of the Union of Women's Federation between 70 and 75, when we were active, and this is Ella and myself and, and others, in the Women's Liberation Movement. And it deals with the analysis of why women are oppressed, suggestion or the, the, the Marxist um, solutions to how you, how you overcome the oppression, but also dealing with the day-to-day -day events throughout that period of 70 to 75 in the women's liberation movement. All the forces, all the, all the meetings and all the arguments that were put forward, as well as looking at the history of women in the socialist countries and how when socialism actually implemented, women do achieve liberation. And the question is really, why um, does Sheila and has she throughout her, her life basically dist, although she calls herself a Marxist or is called a Marxist, I believe she calls herself a Marxist, attack oh, Marxism as being incomplete and inadequate and attack the record of the socialist countries because that is, that is our means of improving our lot. And that is the hope that we have that, it, that gives us the, the, the enthusiasm to carry on what is a very long and very hard struggle. OK, this thank is, you. This is the book. If you want a history of well, the we women's liberation we, movement, this is the actually, book. Actually, we, can we, we can't see the book. Hold you it can't up. see the book. 
Marxism and the Emancipation of Women. Right, okay. That, that title's Published quite Published by Lalkar, L-A-L-K-A-R. Okay, thank you, Meso. Uh, great. Uh, pass you on to Sheila. Do you want to respond to that? Yeah, well, yes, well, Diane Longford also wrote uh, from a, a different kind of Maoist perspective. She did write a, a very interesting thing online, actually, which is about her um, memories of both her left politics and her involvement in uh, the women's movement. So that's also something that people could read. I mean, I have to say that there were very many more socialist feminists who were critical of um, the position that Meisel represented then than there were members of the organization, which was rather a small group within women's liberation. And, that's not. Um, that's not. That's not denied. Not, not the question of size. It's the question of value, isn't it? Oh right. Yes. <laughs> there were a lot of well, feminists, and all the I, feminists talked about sexual liberation, which is not the point. Which is not I the mean, way. It's a, it's a big diversion. Uh, thank you. Well, it's a very good thing that there are different accounts, and the more the better is all I can say. Exactly. Um, I have to say that as I think it was when Diane Longford was saying at the Women's Liberation Conference, how bad it was to sit around looking, contemplating our vaginas, that I roared with laughter. And there is a photograph of me laughing at this, <laughs> because I do think that sexuality is an incredibly important aspect of human um, existence and of human pleasure and delight. And that it is also part of our um, aspiration to have some changes in relation to sexual politics, as quite often now many um, reactionary regimes are really landing on sexual issues, which might have been seen by some Marxists in the past as not that relevant. Okay, let's let's move on. Thank thank you, Maisel. Thank I you. Th I think we got got the points. Uh, Francis, you still there, Francis? You've got you got the floor. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank, thank you, thank you. Um, You're very dark. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know what's happened. I've had the mic, but I've had the uh, thing. Um, it's really, I mean, the the question of socialist feminism, which I know Sheila has just kind of um, uh, you know problematized for us, but. How do you actually see that current today? Because what I can see from outside looking at the landscape is, you know, a radical feminist uh, current which still still exists and is still making quite cogent critiques of uh, current developments in society. I can see a kind of liberal feminism which, you know, in many respects looks to be not that liberal and not that feminist either. But the socialist feminist current seems to me to be at a very low end. Would you agree with that, or am I just following the wrong Twitter accounts? I Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, there, there isn't any um, organised presence of people who would call themselves socialist feminists, but there are loads of socialist feminists still around. Um, you know, we're still alive, quite a few of us, and we all tend to know each other, but we're not an organised um coherent presence and we certainly we don't we only get a very spasmodic um, coverage in the media and usually as individuals not as um, any kind of um, political presence so uh, but I mean the the jet the gist of the, a lot of what was the same politics as socialist feminists had is very much present in among a lot of younger feminists, actually, who um, not all of whom would go along with, uh, uh, you know, a, a radical feminist separatism kind of politics. So the, the the gist of it is, I mean, I think that so has passed out of the general kind of media discourse because people hardly ever talk about socialists or socialism very much um, in the media anymore. I mean, they might talk about some kind of general radicalism, but not very much about socialism or even about Marxism, actually. 
Thank you. Uh, tell that. You still there? Tell that to you. Your, the, the floor is yours. Uh, you'll tell that? Yes, I am. Yes. Thank you, go, David. Go, go ahead. Yeah, hi, thanks. Um, thank you, Sheila. Um, I'm really enjoying your talk and the conversation. Um, and I also have a copy of your book. I haven't read it page to page yet, but I have dipped into it. Um, and, uh, and it's fantastic. I just want to ask a question really about um, sort of working class culture and the resilience of it, because um, especially because you mentioned um, May Hobbs and, um, and I'm thinking particularly of, um, of her own little memoir about growing up in Hackney, particularly in Hoxton. And I used to live in Hackney um, in my twenties and thirties. And one of the things that's uh, is very striking um, about working class experience is that you know, the, the sort of the, the, the right always wants to try and make out that working class people and working class culture is backward, um, that you know they're unintelligent um, and um, really a bit stupid and atomized. But one of the things that also stands out in um, Hobbes' account, but also comes across in your book, is um, you know, a sense of collectivity, the sense of solidarity amongst working class culture as well and working class experience and also a sense of humor um, in terms of um, you know, so like um, what working class experience is about um, and yes of course you know there is poverty yes of course there is hardship there's all those kinds of things but there is also a sense of resilience based around solidarity and collectivity which thankfully at moments of people coming together and challenging together, you know, really sparks out in a beautiful way. And that's in, in a few of the snippets that I've already looked at in your book. That's one of the things that really comes through, which is, um, yeah, which, you know, which I think find really exciting. So I just wondered what, yeah, whether or not you have a comment about that. Well, I think one, one example of that uh, tenacity still going on is the campaign um, uh, around the whole issue of the Sh Shrewsbury building workers who were uh, um, successfully vindicated after all these years. And that group uh, has carried on um, struggling, you know, to make, get to clear their name after all, all that time. So that that's certainly true. And I, I, I don't know, I'm not, what I, don't know is how what young people young working class people's responses are to what's happening in in politics now I, I really don't know and perhaps other people would have a better some better some better idea because um Mike, Mike and I often notice when uh, we go to meetings that people are definitely um older but we we did go to to one uh, meeting with uh, which which because I got asked to talk, which everybody was in their twenties, and that was Bristol uh, Transformed meeting, and um, they uh, <laughs> I think it was quite strange because they were all in their twenties, and then a whole gang of people in their seventies appeared. <laughs> <laughs> and then they invited us to the pub. The pub. Yes, we went to the pub. <laughs> and that was quite funny. I think that the, the young women found it easier actually to talk to us than the young men, because um, I I don't know they 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 tended to stay in a kind of clump, but the young women came and, and talked to the oldies more. The men were a bit more traditional, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, she Sheila, I've got a couple more questions. So, so, some are quite similar on similar themes, but uh, I'll get the two people. To, one person previously asked if you have published any poetry. Um, so I'll no, ask that well, now. I, uh, yeah. There's been... I did a, a book called Dreams and Dilemmas, and there's some in there. Uh -huh. um, for, that was a long time ago. Virago, um, yeah, one or that. two, yeah, one or two got put into other things, but uh, no, I nearly got into an anthology. Nearly, <laughs> vainly, rather vainly, would say I was rather chuffed about, but I, 
I was taken out because it was too the the anthology was too long and they had to take. Oh uh, well, maybe you should bring them all. To, maybe you should bring, collect them all together and put them in a, a, vo a volume. Oh thought, well, my you... my mother had a, a saying that she always said, which was from a song, which was, "I took my harp to a party and no one asked me to play, so I read them to you." <laughs> instead. Oh, I don't know if that's true. I mean, get get a book of poetry out. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm also part of a, a poetry group as well as well as history, so so I can sympathise with people who write poetry on the quiet and don't get it published. Uh, but uh, you know, I've had a few published, uh, one or two. But uh, you know, I do recommend you to carry on with that. It's it's, it's a therapy as well, isn't it? Uh, no, anyway, now can I move on to Sophie, who wants to ask a question? Sophie uh, Scotts. I, some, some, I, I've forgotten the whole name, but anyway, Sophie, you're still there. Log in and answer. Hello, questions. thanks, David. Uh, Hello. Sheila, thank you um, so much for that talk. That was really interesting. Um, I, um, I aspire to call myself a historian of the first new left in the history workshop and Raphael Samuel. Um, and I found Promise of a Dream incredibly useful whilst I was initially researching all this. So thank you very much for that. And I know I'm going to love um, Daring to Hope. I'm looking forward to, to reading it properly soon. So I just have a sort of quick question. Um, and it, so you mentioned a few of uh, some very, very familiar, well-known names to us all, and, uh, um, and especially to me, uh, Raphael Samuel, Stuart Hall, and E.P. Thompson, of course, this sort of puts me in mind of that first new left group that sort of came through initially in 56, 57, and... Um, and sort of clustered around the uh, the new reasoner, the university's left review, and ultimately the new left review. And I was sort of wondering whether you thought that there was any kind of through running threads there or any connections with that particular, that first new left moment. And I know it's sort of a bit ridiculous to speak of that because it wasn't uh, coherent or agreed in any particular form. I suppose I'm thinking whether there were some sort of shared sets of questions or problems particularly around this idea of um, of difference, of fragmentation, of how you kind of cooperate amongst different factions, of what you do with uh, culture, but particularly, I suppose, with this idea of activism and direct action rooted in community organising, being possibly a way to structure a kind of new political sensibility, something like that. Anyway, um, thank you very much. Thank you. That's Sheila. Oh, I I think uh, I think that uh, I mean I I in age I I kind of was a bit of a sort of interim person because um, I was younger than the old new left of the ones who were in their forties. I was in nineteen when I met Dorothy and Edward, and they would be in I think their late thirties or early forties then. Um, and they just seem to have seen so much, you know, because that I realise now that, that it was the generation that had gone through the war, which my generation were blithe, rather, we tended to rather dismiss what that experience had been because we, we just wanted to kind of move on. But I really, I realize, I've been really realising as I've got older what a, an enormous thing that was, but it, it felt at the time that they they were so much more grown up than, than we were because they'd just gone through s such extreme experiences. Um, but I think that the I, the ideas of what became kind of you know do it yourself action, um, I think quite. The, the, the meeting would have been um, Committee of 100 and the CND. The first big move that a lot of other people too here. I um, was very much affected by those ideas of, you know, the direct action sitting down and things like that, that people were advocating then. I, I'm not certain whether the Communist Party, the former Communist Party people who left the Communist Party. I mean, they, that the, the, the direct action stuff in CND was coming out of the anarchist. And I, 
I, because of CND, I picked up anarchist stuff as well as um, New Left. Um, I think the, the people who'd been in the CP, they were, they were more strategic and thoughtful and wary about sort of confronting the state head on um, because they had gone through that sort of Cold War time when, although it was much less in Britain, um, it had affected a lot of people and a, a lot of people had be, had realized that you know they couldn't carry on working and things like that um i mean christopher hill's wife bridget hill lost her job because of that that kind of uh, pre that kind of prejudice so i think i mean it wasn't as extreme as the states where you really couldn't call yourself a socialist so the, the, when the new left appeared in America, they tended to talk about being radical, which completely mystified French socialist friends of mine who said, why are you always going on about radical in women's consciousness, man's world? Because in France, that means that you're anti-socialist. So the, 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 the terms have different, slightly different meanings. And uh, it, it's quite, it's it's you have to say what the terms mean, don't you really? Um, in in order to to understand why they they there would be different reactions, and I've mm. wandered off from the question. Thank, thank you, thank you. <laughs> but it is it is I think it's that it it's some because I just sort of landed among these older people. I didn't kind of consciously think about how. I was different or they were different. I do remember there were some reactions with Dorothy Thompson having a furious argument because I like fairs. I love fun fairs and things like, um, you know, going on the bumper cars and things like that. <laughs> and Dorothy thought fairs were really oppressive places where, you know, <laughs> people were, you know, working under terrible conditions and, and that I shouldn't like these fun fairs. And we had such an argument <laughs> about fun fairs. <laughs> so there were these kind of weird differences of age in, in terms of reaction to things. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, part, that's part of the contradiction. I've just, I've just picked this book off my shelf. Papers from the Women's Liberation Movement, 1972 to 74. And there's an interest, talking about contradictions, there's an interesting chapter with a, a title I quite like, The Patter of Tiny Contradictions, which I don't know if people can get hold of that. I don't see your name in here, Sheila, but there's other people like Beatrix Campbell, Elizabeth Wilson, uh, and it was put published in Leeds. So uh, I'm, I'm sure you've got a copy. Micheline Wonder, and Oakley. Lee and, Coma. Uh, various, various Lee other Coma. Things. Yes, that's right. And Lee, Lee, Lee Coma. Coma is one of the socialist feminists who's still around. Is she? Where is she? Yeah. Is it, she lives she, in she, London she, now. Okay, I don't. I don't think I know her, but she. she, and she, she there put, are there are groups. There's a group called How, which uh, uh, Sue O'Sullivan is involved in. And she uh, put this book together. How is history of women's liberation. And so the, the, there are some uh, groups and networks that still exist, women's liberation networks. But we're kind of invisible. So hopefully... Um, hopefully after today, not so invisible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, thank you. Uh, there's one more question. Mehmet, can you come in? Where is he? Is he still there? <laughs> It's it's actually Hillary. That, that that's Mehmet, and both of us oh, have been typing. Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Anyway, we've got you. We've got you. So th th some of some of the Hello. points. Are... <laughs> it's really nice to see you. I haven't seen you for a very long time. I also spotted, um, I spotted other people that I haven't seen for a long time, including Logie. Oh, um, yes. So and John so... Charlton. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so Mehmet Ali has been typing one or two comments in, but I had a question, Sheila, about um, there were a couple of things that struck me. One, you said that you were influenced by the American writers within the Black Power movement. Um, and 
then this discussion about the, you know, whether we remember socialist feminism of the 1970s. And um, it occurs to me, and it's, it's occurred to me a couple of times that the publishing industry has been quite dominated with, um, by, by American feminism. And of course, white American feminism tended to be a campus movement um, and a middle class movement and didn't come out of, out of um, socialist thinking in the way that it did in the UK. Unlike, of course, um, black feminism in, in, in the US, which, which did come out of a different, <clears throat> excuse me, a different kind of politics and a different, a different place. Um, and at the same time, there's been a lack of translation of other um, very uh, other feminist movements that were very much informed by feminism, particularly the Italian feminists. Sorry, informed by, by Marxist thinking and socialist thinking, like the Italian feminists. So I wonder if part of the problem is um, of that forgetting of socialist feminist history is partly to do with, with the publishing industry and publishing opportunities. Um, I, I don't know, I'm just putting this out as a, as a, as a general question, really. Um, you know, what, because the, the movement, the feminist movement here seems to be still so dominated by American voices within, within publishing. So I'm wondering if we're actually kind of misremembering our history as being American history. Yes, I know. This is, it's, it, there's, there's so many coils within coils about this that I, I think the American, um, I mean, the people I knew, like Rosalind Baxendale, who I write about in, in the book, were people who had been uh, very much coming from the left. There was a, a lot of the red, what they called red diaper babies who got into women's liberation. And, um, and they had even the idea of this International Women's Day March came from actually from the communist in America. But um, it, it had, uh, and it was the communists who used to, to do that march, communist women. And they, somebody in America had sort of vaguely heard about this from their mother or auntie or someone. And that they, so they, re they reintroduced it. Um, actually, I mean, communists um, had a sort of indirect influence on both, both women's liberation movements in Britain and in, um, in America because you know, they, they had existed before and were a large Marxist um, organization compared to um, other groups. So they tended to have a, a lot of older people who'd been through it and though they weren't necessarily sympathetic, all those women who were in the, in the Communist Party, but the, the, the impact of the ideas carried on. I mean, Ros, wrote about um, uh, uh, Gurley Flynn, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. But I mean, nobody in the popular media now would be going on about Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. And um, so there, there was a left, a left influence on the American women's separation movement, although there was also um, conflict and antagonism as well between the generations. So it's, I just think it's, uh, not that you know socialism is sort of nosedive to something that people really talk about very much and and so when jeremy corbyn popped up in the labor party there was an absolute kind of panic and outcry about this wild and incredibly left-wing and revolutionary idea that you ought to nationalize a few industries that a lot of people are very dependent on even within capitalism so I, I, I think that um, is. I mean, it would be quite refreshing to hear more from the people who were from a socialist, feminist, American left political ideas. But you don't. You just don't. You just don't get that kind of view. But I think the one thing that does get through is the. Um, African American women who tended to be more 
left than um, the, the liberal feminist tradition of now. And so we do get those uh, politics coming over to a certain extent. I think the, the problem is that then that suppresses and makes it more difficult um, for women of African and Afro-Caribbean origin in Britain to assert what they did, and that that gets buried too. So we, we do have a lot of influence from America for bad or worse, or good or bad. It's not, um, I mean, I think it's a mixed, mixed bag, really. Thank you. John, John Thank you. Atfield. Are you still there? Yes. Yes, Dave. Come Hello. On, come on um, thanks very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm also a bit um, appreciative of the fact that we're overrunning time a little bit. I do just want to say how lovely it is to see Sheila. I was secretary of the Communist Party History Group all the way through the 1970s. And um, Sheila was very much a figure of respect for us, even at that time. And um, I think, though, from what I remember, we never plucked up the courage to ask Sheila to ever do anything for us. Um, <laughs> but, um, um, that's um, not, because of, not because of not wanting to. Um, I just wanted to ask a very quick question, if you would comment about um, identity politics the term identity politics and the way that um, uh, it often seems to be used, uh, as it were, weaponized by people um, against anything progressive. A little bit on the lines of you have to love Kamala Harris because otherwise you're a misogynist racist, things like that. Well, I, I don't know about <laughs> I, I was sort of about, I don't know enough about Kamala Harris, but I, I, I don't, I mean, I, I think for each, every group that has a specific form of um, subordination, there's, it's a bit, it's a bit like the thing I was saying in uh, Edward Thompson's thing on um, education experience, that the important thing is that you, you have to assert things about your own identity and your own existence and being but at the same time it's really important that all of us try to to recognize that we are also more than our particular place that we're plunked in by society so there's both two things one is that you have to assert things that are being missed out because of oversight or direct prejudice and you also have to try to go beyond the situation that you happen to be in yourself personally, because otherwise there's, there's no way in which you can get beyond argy bargying I'm this or this or this, you know. And it's, if you, I mean, as Edward said, really, if you stay within your category, like I'm, you know, I'm just a worker or, I'm a woman or I'm um, from a country that has been colonized. You've got, a, uh, you've got something that you're saying, but at the same time, there's also other things that you're, you're never only just that. Does that make sense? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yes. <laughs> Thanks, John. Are you are you in a tube station? Um, no, it's my um, oh. uh, back, background <laughs> picture. I'm okay. I'm actually I'm actually in Germany. Oh right, no, nowhere near Baron's Court. I thought you were freezing out outside in a tube station. <laughs> <laughs> Very effective. Thank, thanks anyway, John. Lovely Thank to hear you. from you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. <laughs> 
Uh, I don't know if I've got any more questions. Uh, I think so we should round up now. Uh, 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 thank you, Sheila. I think it's been fascinating, especially with all these old voices, not old voices, but voices from the past who uh, 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 we used to meet in public <laughs> when we could do uh, <laughs> a long time ago. But, uh, you know, th thanks for doing this talk you look exhausted i hope you're not <laughs> <laughs> we haven't exhausted you with all our silly questions <laughs> no i think it's just it's just concentrating it's very nice to see you all yeah it's lovely to see you all. i need i need to get a copy of that book now <laughs> i only didn't buy one because i had so much to read and i didn't think i was going to chair the meeting so, so i thought i could skip it for a while <laughs> no i get I think... tired at night now and when uh, i used to read into the night but now oh, i get too tired same here I used <laughs> my to read reading till... has got so, so slower and i've got a pile of books that i'm i know i used to read till three and four o'clock but i, I mean <laughs> bye 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 11.30, I've fallen asleep and the book's on the floor. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's that's what happens to us. But anyway, that's fascinating. And I think, I think unless there's any final urgent comments or questions anyone wants to make, I will, I will express uh, uh, thanks for your, for your uh, uh, participation and for, for this uh, wonderful meeting, the first great launch for 2022 okay. for the Socialist History Center. And good luck with the book. I'm sure it's going to be a bestseller. Well, it already <laughs> is in the top. It's in the top 10 of the Verso publishing list. So that, that, where, where could it... We don't know what it? the sales of the other books are. Do <laughs> they don't reveal the actual sales, you know, the important <laughs> questions. <laughs> You'll know when you get the royalties, I imagine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but get your libraries to stock it if you don't, if you still have a library. I mean, I know uh, we, we, they're getting f fewer and fewer. I don't know if it's an e-book as well. It probably is an e-book. Oh, no, well, I got, I got three pounds from public I mean, lending I can't read e right this time. <laughs> to the year. That's, that's <laughs> your whole book, the old twenty odd volumes. <laughs> oh my goodness, uh, I'm going to mm. starve. I've only got one slim volume to my name. <laughs> this really, I mean, this thing of the libraries is really terrible. The closing of libraries. Yeah, it's it's it's, and the university's culling their stock as well. That's that's another uh, crime. Crime against intelligence, I think. Anyway, thanks to everyone, and uh, especially to you, Sheila. And keep, 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 you know, keep, keep writing and get these poetry published as well. You know, what we want what people want to read it out there. We've had two or three questions about the poetry. Anyway, uh, thanks to everyone for joining us. I'll draw the. Uh, unless you want some final words, uh, Sheila, to say it's a final message to the to the world. <laughs> No, <laughs> go, go and have a cup of tea. That's what I'm going to go and have a day. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Th thanks very much. Th thank you. Bye. <laughs> bye. Bye. I'll draw the meeting to a close. I think Steve's mm -hmm. going to log us all off in a minute anyway. Mm -hmm. Yes. It stopped. The recording has stopped. <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you anyway david uh just nice. nice. lovely session well done lovely david session. brilliant brilliant <laughs> yes steve what do you want to do it say just leaving it open for a minute because it's also being transmitted on youtube and there's oh, about yes, five, yes and there's about a five minute delay so oh, some right, people okay. are watching it and i don't want to cut them off till the end oh no so, don't cut uh, oh, no. Uh, so if we say this is finished, this is the end, and I'll close it down. Uh, formally, formally, it's actually over, yeah. yeah. It, and, it, and then I, and I'll close it all down when it's uh, done. I've stopped recording. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thanks, Sheila. Sheila. That was, that was Thanks, lovely. Steve. Thank you. Sheila, yeah, if you're still great. there, send me your email. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. I think she's gone. Who was, who was asking for Sheila's email address? I've got it, but I don't know if she wants to give it out unless she knows you. Right.